Star Wars Battlefront 2 2005 released on November 1st, 2005. When this happened, I was 7 years old, and I was in love. I remember wanting to play it the most during rainy days. I would have gotten up early to see that it was nothing but overcast. So what I would do is I'd head up to the loft, turn on my original Xbox, play for the next two hours until my dad told me it was time to stop. I was only allowed to play video games for two hours every day unless I read a chapter of a book. But fuck that. So my stubbornness as a child made those moments playing the game special. And I'll cherish every moment of me leaving my house after the two hours were up to go play it at my next door neighbors on their PlayStation 2. I loved Star Wars Battlefront 2. Even if it wasn't entirely very complex, my kid brain was dying to invent stories about why I was playing, either giving myself little side missions as to why Command Post 3 was lost, or now Command has called me in to get it back, or we lost Naboo in the Galactic Civil War and it will be up to my platoon to head down and retake it. I was in love. Then, like everything, I began seeing new, more polished experiences. And the old eventually faded out, and the new exploded in. But I began to wonder, where is Star Wars Battlefront 3? Star Wars Battlefront Renegade Squadron was making its release, yet I didn't own a PSP, and I was only ever lucky enough to have friends who owned the hardware and software to give this game a shot. It had more of what I loved, but it didn't evolve the way I saw other games doing so. Then one day, in 2009, a trailer was released on the Nintendo channel for the Wii. And Star Wars Battlefront Elite Squadron had been announced. And immediately, and without question, my mind's imagination had begun exploding in speculation at the possibilities. The promise of space-to-ground combat was the type of evolution I had been waiting for. Combining the battlefields in space and the worlds I had fallen in love with in the previous game sounded like a dream come true. However, the first trailer had shown one small little detail that instantly killed all the hype entering my brain. The only two platforms shown for release were PSP and Nintendo DS. And even though I was 11 at the time, I knew that the DS and PSP weren't going to be powerful enough to handle the scales that they had been promising. Maybe these handheld versions would release first, and the much bigger, grander console versions would release down the line. Well, thanks to a series of articles by GameSpot, missed deadlines, mismanagement, and broken builds led to the collapse of not only Free Radical, but Star Wars Battlefront 3's original design. GameSpot states, additionally, the source claimed several game modes were not implemented, and the only gameplay in place was Team team-based free-for-all, which we now know from the build of the game leaked in 2016, the major game mode, Galactic Conquest, was completely thrown to the wind, but not for the last time, more on that later. So in the end, what Free Radical couldn't complete, Rebellion, the makers of Renegade Squadron, came in to pick up the pieces, and ended up shipping out Elite Squadron instead. After this, the Star Wars Battlefront franchise had laid silent. Until one day. Jokes aside, in the moment, the Disney acquisition of Star Wars was not inherently a bad thing. In the beginning, there were plenty of jokes calling Leia a Disney princess, but the opportunity for Star Wars to have a revival was there. And we all knew the buying power and massive budget of Disney could mean great things for the franchise. Then the next bombshell dropped. Full exclusive rights to publish Star Wars games for the next decade was given to none other than Electronic Arts. Which at first is a little shocking, and fairly worrying. During this era of the company, only one year prior in April of 2012 had they been declared the worst company in America by the consumerist. And then once again for a second time in 2013 which all came from their terrible launch of the SimCity reboot, Mass Effect 3's poorly received ending, and Dead Space 3's microtransaction missteps. At first glance, it seemed like the worst choice on the planet. Yet EA had one studio under their branch that seemed to make all the rest of that bullshit worth it. If Pandemic had a design in their mind when planning out the original Star Wars Battlefront, there was only one studio whose homework they had probably copied. Handing DICE a pair of keys to the Star Wars franchise really can only lead to one single decision. In the moment of the announcement that EA had received exclusive rights to publish Star Wars video games for the next decade, my mind's second thought was a Star Wars Battlefront reboot spearheaded by DICE. The executives across the company most likely had the exact same idea as the rest of us because that's exactly what happened. And it couldn't have been more of the perfect fucking nightmare that it turned out to be.
Dice has every ounce of talent, skill, experience, and the balls to pull off making Star Wars Battlefront's next generation truly the evolution of the franchise that the fans had been waiting for. And EA also had the capacity to just about fuck up every aspect of it. Star Wars Battlefront 2015 by EA and DICE ended up being one of the most graphically impressive games of the 8th console generation, capturing the Star Wars aesthetic better than any game that has ever come before it. It was truly like stepping into the battles of the large-scale movies. The sandbox design that had come with Pandemic's Battlefront and the classic Battlefield games had come and gone. DICE had opted in for a linear game design, focusing on AT-AT's slowly pushing in on Rebel Forces with their game mode, Walker Assault, which at first glance gives way to some of the most cinematic moments Star Wars gaming has ever given me, but the downside being the longevity to this experience was non-existent. The game's biggest criticism at launch was how shallow the game had felt for a $60 release, along with the price for a $50 DLC plan. The game was multiplayer only, no single player campaign, and Galactic Conquest had been cut just like the Free Radical iteration. Only four multiplayer maps launched with what was advertised as the main game mode, Walker Assault. It had felt like EA had done it again, making business decisions unfriendly for the consumer while DICE was not given the proper resources to pay any respect to the original game's design. In a Reddit post, a DICE developer ended up answering a few questions from the community on the reasoning behind the game's lack of features and more simplistic feel compared to the original series. Of which he answered saying, Sometimes you have to make choices, and those choices may be hard. I interpreted this answer as, They weren't given a lot of time or resources to do what the legacy demanded, and that's why the game was limited as it was. So fans packed it up and left Star Wars Battlefront 2015 behind, and somehow... EA announced another one. Star Wars Battlefront 2 2017's launch lives in infamy. It's not often that the launch of a video game becomes headline mainstream news along with politicians taking some shots. It's a trap. If you haven't heard about the loot box controversy that stopped Star Wars Battlefront 2 2017 in its tracks, then let me give you the spark notes. Star Wars Battlefront 2 2017 launched with a progression system of unlocks that expanded on the star card system from DICE's first game, star cards being the game's equipment and abilities, the things that you will be using to play within a match to change play styles, or how much of an advantage others have against you or you have against them. Star cards had one major change to the game this time around. One of the major ways they could be obtained was by unlocking randomly generated crates, which upon opening the crate you had a randomized chance at receiving new star cards. Crates could either be unlocked with in-game credits, or, here's the kicker, with real-world currencies. The option of using real-world currencies is what sparked the anger that started the fire that got the politicians in the mix, of which, to this day, legislation has still been in the works all around the world, slowly calling for the removal of RNG loot mechanics. The system was eventually fully removed from Star Wars Battlefront 2 around six months after release, and the remnants of the Star Cards upgrade system are still in-game. The game then slowly moved over to a live service model based on skins and cosmetics, away from RNG purchases. And currently, the game's live service has come to an end, and there are no longer any ways to purchase items in-game using real-world currency. The game is no longer anywhere close to the disaster its launch created. Many fans, including myself, would call this game redeemed. A lot of work went into the game's post-launch content, including a game mode that moves the game closer to its original series design. Capital Supremacy came to Star Wars Battlefront 2 2017 in March of 2019 allowing for the original command posts of the classic games to come back, but still lacking their full utility of being a spawn point and changing your class on the fly. Contextual spawning finally being added back in in August of 2019 allowed command posts some of their original functions. This situation of a game element missing functionality, lacking quality of life features, or missing entirely when elements similar to it are present in other features, is found all across Star Wars Battlefront 2. For example, there is no crouch icon for when in first person. Weapon reticles vary in height depending on the classes you play as. Base troopers have a slightly elevated aiming reticule, while special units, except for the death trooper, are lower and parallel with your character. Boba Fett's jetpack is missing hover and zoom functionality like the First Order jet trooper. Capital supremacy transition cutscenes are missing from the Age of Resistance. Second your boots hit the deck. You need to track down those targets and hit them with 
and the capital ship assault sequences are nowhere to be found in the Age of Rebellion, along with starfighters being completely absent from the game mode with support for starfighters being abandoned entirely after the game's second season. Star Wars Battlefront II 2017's design philosophy isn't consistent compared to Pandemic's 2005 release. I remember during Star Wars Battlefront's reboot announcement, there was a lot of talk about how Battlefront won't play like the Battlefield games, and a lot of fans coming out and saying that it should. In the end, DICE's Battlefront had focused on their Walker Assault game mode, and you see this choice in linear design happen all over again in DICE's sequel. However, despite this decision to make the game a more linear ride, after the loot box controversy, Battlefront 2 had a complete shift in philosophy. They had begun giving fans what they wanted after burning them all so badly with their predatory monetization tactics. The boot of Disney had to be felt on EA's neck at this point. EA was going to give DICE the opportunity to fix the game, but not with the resources to do it. Rumors had spread around this time, saying that less than 30 developers had been put in place to clean up the mess that loot boxes had caused. Despite the team announcing that the vision for Star Wars Battlefront 2 2017 was complete, small elements around the game reveal that this was not the case. EA had gotten tired of their commitment to build what they deemed was no longer profitable, and wanted the team to move on to new projects. So now, what we are left with is this, and honestly, it's still a much better place, but it's somewhere in the middle. When you look at DICE's game, it's impressive how many of the old systems feel modernized and brought up to speed. From the gunplay to movement mechanics to class customizations, weapons now have this very fun and lore-friendly venting mechanic, rather than ammo counts and reloads. And the classic technique of rolling has become a fundamental maneuver you will do constantly when in firefights or avoiding melee. DICE knew that this dodge roll was integral to the combat of the previous series, so in their game we now have a roll icon on the UI separate from a stamina bar, with different numbers of rolls depending on the unit that you're controlling. Star cards feel like an extra grind at this point. The star card upgrade system really only remains in place for the few that did purchase loot boxes during launch so that their money hasn't gone to waste. Yet the system encourages new players to stay away. If this game ever wanted to be taken seriously in a competitive setting like most hero players do, the star card grind removes that from possibility. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just go into a heroes versus villains match. At least the progression system behind the star card unlocks functions very well. Just expect to be outgunned by every veteran player in one-on-ones for a little while. I would love to see the system change to a single tier unlock instead of all the common, rare, and epic upgrades. I have all my cards purpled for my base classes, upgraded units, and vehicles, but damn it, did it take a while to get there. And I'll probably never end up taking the time to do that for heroes. Jesus Christ, those matches can be so one-sided. Pandemic's commitment to the sandbox philosophy puts the control largely in the player's hands. My favorite example of this is Star Wars Battlefront 2 2005's Hoth map. The map is split into five command posts. To the east, two command posts are given to the Imperials with two AT-ATs spawned, which also act as mobile spawn points during the match. While to the west, the Rebels have three command posts, one of which is the shield generator that can be destroyed by the Empire, stopping any more Rebels from spawning there. Inside of the hangar are a few snow speeders for you to jump into and fly. These snow speeders you can either take to another location of the map, or you can use the tow cable to go in and destroy enemy walkers. These small details end up creating large consequences for the rest of the battle, along with small side objectives for each team. Looking at DICE's version of the map, the command posts are placed in an hourglass shape. Two in the back, one in the middle, and two in the front. The hangar is no longer accessible during Supremacy, and the AT-ATs are not found anywhere. You are able to control AT-STs, yet the Rebels have no other vehicles other than Tauntauns which leave you fairly exposed. DICE's version of Hoth wasn't originally designed for capital supremacy in the first place. It's a slightly enlarged play space from the first stage of the map for Walker Assault. In fact, most maps for capital supremacy, except for Geonosis and Felucia, are refitted versions of Walker Assault maps. The game was originally designed with a linear play style in mind. Pandemic wanted the battles to evolve and change the map over time, while giving the player the choice as to how and when that will happen. DICE once took this kind of approach to map design with an old buzzword they invented for Battlefield 4. Levolution. Levolution was the idea that massive map changing elements would be added that could change the overall flow of battle or the way you approach conflicts. Oftentimes, however, this made the map a little bit less enjoyable than before the event happened. The best example being on the map, the Siege of Shanghai in Battlefield 4. 
where the C flag was placed on top of a skyscraper, and at the bottom of the skyscraper, a few large pillars are placed that were destructible. If you had enough firepower, you could collapse the entire tower into a pile of rubble, changing the map permanently for the rest of the match. However, despite this massive element being able to change the flow of the game, players realized that the map was more interesting before the tower collapsed. Having a major location to fight over on top of a skyscraper was quite fun, and knocking it down was only interesting for a few moments. Fighting in the rubble that remained made the map worse, because the center of the map was now looked down on from all other angles, making C the worst flag to fight for. What Battlefield had discovered recently in Battlefield 5 that Pandemic discovered long ago was that smaller set pieces with interactivity give maps like this a lot of life. Battlefield leaning harder into destructible structures sprinkled around the map shows that the micro battles that are fought create a macro destruction to the maps that ultimately changes the way that everyone plays. My squad put a hole in a building to try and draw out the enemy's cover, but we also lost the ability to use that cover for ourselves. It feels natural to do this because the set pieces are not scripted. A few medium sized set pieces in the new Wake Island help demonstrate this. Along with the player-controlled V1 rocket, this makes the entire map run for cover the second it's heard. The beginning of a match in Battlefield 5 on Eris looks visibly and physically feels different than it did when we started playing. How does all of this relate to DICE's Battlefront 2? Am I saying add destruction? Not exactly. But maybe some more interaction with props would add more life to the maps. Places like Tatooine and Tychodana feel a little bit more static than they should. I'm not saying you should be able to destroy every single wall and building across the galaxy, although that does sound pretty good on paper. DICE realized what the fans wanted for Star Wars Battlefront 2 was a sandbox experience. Like the quote I pulled earlier, hard choices had to be made. DICE was not given the time or the resources to flesh out the Battlefront experience that fans have always been grabbing at and asking for, and the task at hand is not an easy experience to create. It's insanely impressive the artistry and innovation that went into Star Wars Battlefront 2 post-launch. If the design philosophy from the start was catered towards player freedom, we might be in a completely different scenario right now. But that's not what happened, and that's why I'm here talking about it. So maybe next time we'll get the game we wanted. EA losing exclusivity to the Star Wars license means that they have some competition when it comes to this. How much pressure will be put on them to actually create the Battlefront 3 fans have been waiting for? Will we ever see Galactic Conquest again? Will the game truly take a sandbox approach to its design? Will I be able to board enemy capital ships? Who knows. I think it's clear the direction DICE wants to move in. The question is, will they ever be given the chance? Hey, you made it to the end. Thanks for sticking around. This channel's pretty small right now, so if you liked what you saw, consider subscribing for more. And if you really liked what you saw, consider checking out the Patreon that went live today. The goal of the Patreon right now is pretty much a big experiment to see if I'm going to get any support at all for the work that I do. So if you really want to see me keep doing stuff, consider heading over there and checking that out. And if you made it this far, tell me what you remember the most from the video. Peace. Catch you in the next one.